I think that when women are in this situation, larger couples are in this situation, they are willing to try anything that they heard was a success. And one thing that you hear about from time to time might be the efficacy of a gluten-free diet on uh, fertility treatments. This is something you look at. Absolutely. So gluten-free diets have become extremely popular. They're all over the news. They're all over the supermarkets. There's tons of gluten-free products anywhere you go. And all you see everywhere you turn is that gluten-free diets will actually be the solution for so many different medical problems. And we've been hearing a lot more about patients going on gluten-free diets because of infertility, thinking that was going to solve all of their problems. So what we did was we did a study where we actually looked at what is the impact of gluten-free and celiac testing on patients as far as infertility treatments are concerned. And what did you find there? I mean, is this something that you are seeing really does make a difference? So what we actually did in the study was we tested infertility patients to see if they were truly positive for celiac antibodies. And what we found was the percentage of patients who were actually celiac positive was no, not at all increased in infertility patients. Ultimately, you had just the same risk of being celiac positive if you were infertile as if you were not infertile in the general population. So really, it pretty much told us that there's no higher rate of celiac patients in the infertile group. So having celiacs does not necessarily mean there's going to you're going to have problems with fertility. No, actually, um, we, we don't really know if they go back and forth. Okay. What we do know is having infertility doesn't increase your risk for being celiac. I see. Okay. So does the gluten-free diet, though, if I, whether or not I am uh, testing for celiac disease, but if I heard my friend who was trying for five years and then she went on a gluten-free diet and then she got pregnant, is that something then that I should try? Well, that was great for her, and we're thrilled. But what we do know from the data is that patients who were self-reporting being on a gluten-free diet Diet, had no higher rates of success than patients, same infertility patients, who were not on a gluten-free diet. Okay, so since we're talking about diet, the other study that we talked about, and then I want to just talk about diet a little bit more in general, but the other thing that we looked at was uh, this ABC test, which had to do with the body mass index, and that's another thing that I think people are, uh, they hear about when they're in this process, and they think, well, if I lost 20 pounds, maybe my success rate would be better. Tell me what you found there. Absolutely. So our ABC trial um, stands for appraisal of body content. And we know that in the world of infertility, obesity is bad for infertility outcomes and IVF outcomes. So we don't exactly know what about obesity is driving those poor outcomes. Over more, we noticed that BMI is not the greatest way to look at obesity. So it holds men and women to the same standard. It makes athletes who are very um, you know, lean and built with a lot of muscle fall into a higher risk category because it makes them seem overweight. So we decided to investigate this a little bit more closely by looking at people's obesity percentage of body fat. So we had people um, actually get on this you know, machine that looks at the amount of water content in different areas of the body, and it calculates what's called bioimpedance um, analysis, and it puts people into different categories of obesity based on their percentage of body fat as opposed to their And what we found is that when you look at obesity using the percentage of body fat, there are people that fall into what we call mismatch groups. So there are people that have normal BMI, but actually increased percentage of body fat. And there are people that have elevated BMI that have a normal percentage of body fat. And what we found is that a lot of the people that are sort of overlooked by having a normal BMI, but have an elevated percentage of body fat, actually have poor IVF problems. And we found that men specifically, um, who I think sometimes get a little bit ignored in the fertility workup, um, the men with normal BMI and increased percent body fat had poor fertilization rates and poor cholesterol. I was actually going to add that as we're having this conversation, is are these, are we specifically talking about the woman here, whether the woman is on a gluten free diet or the, or the woman has the actually the woman has the body mass index, but it also has to do with the male as well. Absolutely. So we looked at both men and women um, undergoing IVF in our study, and we found that obesity and elevated percentage of body fat in both partners um, is not helpful. So is that something you can learn on your own, that you know what your percentage of body fat is, or is it something that you and now are going to be incorporating into what you're doing at the clinic? Well, we know that um, that BMI is a pretty good marker, you know, kind of for an initial evaluation, but that there is a select population who, you know, maybe has a normal weight or maybe is on the borderline of normal and overweight, and those patients might be the ones that are identified with a percentage of body fat issues. 
um, you know, our center has this um, in-body bioelectric impedance analysis machine. Not every fertility center does, but it is something that we can offer to our patients for a potentially closer look. And then what can they do with that? I mean, if they fall into this category where their BMI is good, but their percentage of body fat might be a little elevated. Right. So then we would definitely recommend, you know, lifestyle interventions, maybe meeting with nutritionists to kind of offer various suggestions and options for decreasing their loss. We have nutritionists at our, at our center, so we actually, in all of our offices, we offer nutrition counseling, and we have multiple nutritionists that are working at RMA New Jersey, so it's a very easy thing for our patients to get in and be seen and really start working with them. And truthfully, all the patients that I have that have been working with our nutritionists have been doing really well and enjoying the experience. Well, that's no, I mean, in general, it's a good idea to do whether or not you're trying to get pregnant or not. It's a good idea to take care of yourself in terms of what you're eating, but in this case, it's not necessarily that there is one simple goal, right? Like, it's not like, well, if, if everybody just went on this diet or did the paleo or did it with the free, it would all make a difference. It's really based on the individual, and you have to look at what they, what the situations they might have going on. Just like any infertility of treatment, any infertility evaluation, it's all individualized. It's very important for everybody to be looked at as an individual, which is what we strive to do. And you know, there is no easy fix. There is no one answer. Um, you know, the ideas of changing some of these diets, they can always be hopeful as far as lowering body fat, lowering your BMI, getting you to a good ideal body weight and body fat index. Um, but you know, there's no one right way for anybody. So when I, if you're out there, you know, and you have a friend who says, oh, I, I couldn't, I didn't have success for five years, and then I tried this, and it worked, what would you say to the patient who comes to you with a story like this? Should they try that thing? Well, I would say that's terrific for that person, but everybody's story is different. So let's figure out what your story is and what we can do towards your goal. It may be something that will be helpful for you. It may not, but you can't just say just because. You know, we've done these trials. We don't want to do just ideas and opinions. We're trying to use the data. So with the data, we're not going to go ahead and say, yep, everyone should be on a gluten-free diet. Nobody should eat pizza ever again. What the data is trying to tell us is that is right now we know for a general population it's really not helpful for an infertility change or different yeah, yeah. outcome. But you know there could definitely be some select people that may benefit from that, and that's what you work with your doctor. Let me ask you about the conference in general. Like, have you seen anything or learned anything that's been very exciting for you here? It's definitely just getting underway. There's a lot of really great talks. I've got a list a mile long of all the rooms I want to hit in the next you know, six hours of the meeting. But these meetings are fantastic. It pulls together thousands of people in order to be able to just bring so many different ideas from multiple different countries, many different countries, that it's really, it's, it's, it's an amazing event. Absolutely, I respect that. And for me, as someone kind of up in the early beginning side of my career, there's just so much at this conference, um, different perspectives, and really fantastic stories from all of them. Because one of the things we've talked about in these conversations, these the live conversations that we've had in the past, is just how much this industry is changing on the whole, and how much it's changed over 10 years, 15 years, and, and how far we've come. And so I think events like this, when you're all being able to present to each other what you have found to be successful, it continues that evolution. Absolutely, and it's a community that's ready to share data. You know, we're all about everybody getting better. The ultimate end goal is for people to have healthy babies. That's actually like the tagline for the meeting. So one of the things that's so nice about this infertility community and the reproductive endocrinology community is we're here to share data. We're here to share information. You get an idea and really take that to the next level, maybe in your research or branch out. But we're learning so much that it's it's such a great time. And it's amazing how much it's grown. We, yeah, we were in San Antonio in 2003 for ASRM the last time. And it's, you know, 14 years later, it's dramatically different. So it was the technology. Technology, right? Yeah. Kind of to second that and to demonstrate how far the field has come. Um, I was on my fellowship interviews for REI earlier this year, and I actually was interviewed by the infertility specialist that my parents went to when I was born. And he was joking around with me how much more there is to offer now and compared to today. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much. I won't keep you because I know you have lots to do in here today, but thanks for spending some time and chatting with our uh, viewers here on Facebook. Great. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, doctors. And again, if you have any uh, further questions about these topics and you'd like to send them to us, you can do that uh, here. You can comment below the video. And, of course, you can check out the website, which is rmanj.com. We'll be back a little later on today with some more conversations. We'll be doing it all throughout the next couple of days, so keep joining us. Thanks. Gracias.